Welcome to Fraud Talk, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners monthly podcast. During this time, we will be going inside case studies, talking with the industry's leading experts on fraud, and giving you the tools you need to do your job better. In our inaugural podcast today, we talked to Jay Dottie, CFE, CMA, and President of Griffin Strategies in New York about a case he worked on that not only ended in a civil conviction, but also a recovery of more than half of the funds lost to fraud. Jay has worked in finance, accounting, and investigations for more than 20 years and frequently speaks on financial fraud investigation and prevention. He recently contributed this case he worked on a few years ago with Angela Clancy to our new Bribery and Corruption Casebook. Through a combination of old school investigative techniques and the latest data analytics software, Jay and Angela were able to get back $3 million of the original $4.4 million loss for a client who fell victim to a kickback scheme, as well as a fraudulent purchasing and billing scheme. Jay, why don't you start at the beginning? How did you initially get involved with Brewcorp and the investigation of its employees? So the, the company we, we did the work for, the, uh, Brew Corp, it's a coffee roasting company, and we had done a number of cases for them over the years. Uh, they had actually been the victim of, of many frauds over the years, as a lot of smaller companies have been. Uh, they've had uh, employees stealing cash. They had truck drivers stealing payments on their routes. And so just about you know everything that, that could be uh, perpetrated against a company uh, had been attempted in the past. So the, the, the client we had a longstanding relationship with, we had done a lot of uh, prior investigative work for, and as part of that work, work, you know, because they had some of these problems and they have a product that can be can be stolen uh, rather easily, we, we helped to install a, a security system on site, and that included both video cameras and key card access and, uh, and security lines, and everything was sort of tied together. So, you know, they had a pretty good security system in place. This particular owner was very, very sensitive to employees stealing from the company, and because he'd had all these prior incidents, he, he is a guy who took it seriously and wanted to, to try to contain his losses. So in this particular case, they had a declining, uh, sort of a over the last three to five years, uh, declining profit margins, which the owner had been in the company for a long time. His family had owned the business, and he didn't, you know, he was not a financial guy. He, he was uh, he was a, a product guy. And, you know, he didn't quite understand why the margins were declining. Uh, their sales had been going up, but the margins were, you know, kind of narrowing each year. And, of course, that hit his bottom line, so he was concerned about that. So he called in a couple of his accountants, uh, the, the CFO and, and an accountant uh, who worked for her, it, to do some analysis and try to figure out why these margins were declining. And, uh, you know, they came back and, and basically said that, you know, repair costs <clears throat> had been going up because they hadn't invested in new plant technology and equipment. And, uh, you know, that was essentially the explanation. No, no, Which yeah. kind of sounded plausible. I mean, it sounded... Right. Yeah, and, and the, the owner, you know, Billy Hayes, that's what he thought at the time, too. He, he himself had not wanted to invest in some of the, uh, the technology and the upgrades and, and equipment because he was nearing the end of his career. He wanted to, you know, take his money and run. So he was a little embarrassed that that was the explanation. He sort of blamed himself. But, you know, there was a fairly noticeable decrease in the margin. So he, he still wasn't 100% convinced that that was a problem. And he didn't really like the explanation that they gave him. They seemed a little nervous and sort of unsure of themselves. Let's, let's stop right there for one second. That apprehension that he had, or the paranoia, how important or vital is that when you're president of a company like this? I think it's pretty important. You have to be skeptical, and you have to ask questions, and you have to try to get to the bottom of, uh, of questions when they come up. So, you know, you can't spend all your time second-guessing your employees or, or, you know, trying to figure out what's going on on the ground level. But when you do have issues that arise, it's important to, to ask the questions and to get the right answers. And if you're not satisfied with the answers you get, uh, to do whatever you need to do to get comfortable with them. So after hearing from his CFO and accountant, President Billy Hayes wasn't satisfied with the answers he was getting about the profit margins. You then start using the preventative monitoring devices you had previously installed and discovered something fairly quickly. After viewing the surveillance tapes, what did you find out? What really was the trigger point in this investigation is that uh, one of the, the accountant that actually provided most of the explanation, this guy Luke Smith, um, came into the office at, at 1 a.m. Uh, on a Sunday, and this was, you know, the week after uh, Billy Hayes had had this confrontation with, with Smith and, and uh, Sandy Dawson, the CFO. And so it was just really suspicious timing. Now, the, the security system was set up that, you know, when people entered the premise at, at odd times, um, we would get an email, we could check the cameras, and so 
when you looked at the two things in tandem, you know, both this explanation about the declining margins and, you know, what was this guy doing in there, you know, for two hours on, on Sunday at 1 a.m., you know, it raised the question, is something going on here? What kind of guy was Luke Smith? He seems like he looked good, he sounded good, he looked like an ideal employee in the beginning. Extremely smart, diligent, uh, always did great analysis. One thing they didn't do is they didn't do pre-employment background, so they didn't know, uh, you know, who they were hiring. They just knew the guy was really smart. He was a great accountant. Uh, he always had the right answers. He was very cool under pressure. They put a lot of trust in him. Mm -hmm. The CFO was a longtime CFO. She was nearing retirement, and I think it was a relief to her to have somebody really good that could perform analysis and do things. So a lot of times she wouldn't question his analysis or look any deeper. It was just convenient to have this, uh, this employee that could take care of things. So you and Angela began to look at the data. What did it reveal? First thing we looked at, you know, not that sophisticated, was just what was uh, Smith doing there. The yeah. transactions did he do in the, in the general ledger when he was there. And we found that he had processed some invoices for a company called Exile Industries, which was one of their uh, part suppliers. So it fit into this category of, of repair costs uh, that was the explanation for the declining margins. So right away it looked sort of interesting to us. And, you know, the question was why would somebody go in at 1 a.m. on a Sunday to yeah. process invoices? <laughs> so, you know, right away, big red flag. Um, was he ever confronted early on with why did you come in or did y'all just immediately start investigating and then wait? Yeah, we waited. We didn't confront him first. In most investigations, you want to try to get as much information and facts as you can before you, yeah. you confront the subject. So, uh, you know, we wanted to get our arms around what the story was before we approached him. Obviously, that, that processing of those invoices was was a red flag. We, we put it aside at first. You know, I knew that we wanted to look into Exile Industries a little bit, do some background investigation, determine who they were. But we did some other data analytics first. We looked at the emails as well uh, yeah. to see if see you know what kind of email traffic there was it, both of of the cfo dawson at that time she was under suspicion as well but of smith as well and you know the the correspondence between the two of them were pretty ordinary but that's when you saw jane brown that's right so we saw a lot of correspondence between smith and jane brown who was an engineer uh and it was a little odd that they would be having that much correspondence uh, given their positions. And as we looked at it more, it looked like they had a relationship between the two of them. And there were some indications that uh, they were talking about uh, invoice processing. And, and the other thing that we saw that, that both of them, and, and this was through using the, the data analytics schools, you could kind of look at the, uh, the pattern of emails. You know, we saw that they had a, a common third party that they had a lot of email traffic with, and that was this ghostwriter at gmail.com address. Uh, that was another one of the big red flags. You know, we had this exile payment. We also had all this, this common traffic to this third party. So, you know, right away we wanted to figure out who was behind that, that third party. Now, we couldn't, you know, it wasn't obvious. There wasn't, uh, you know, any email directories that would, uh, you know, would turn up who that was. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty, pretty easy for anybody to create, a, uh, you know, an, an email address without identifiers. So that was just one of those things we flagged and said, okay, we've got to get back to this and figure out who this is. In the meantime, we... We did some additional investigation of Exile Industries, did some background investigation there, sort of the standard stuff, public records, litigation histories, uh, judgments, liens, etc. And we found out that, that Exile had actually filed a bankruptcy three years earlier. So, you know, that was a, obviously a huge red flag. This company's been bankrupt for three years. This guy's coming in at, uh, at 1 a.m. on a Sunday and making payments to this company. You know, what yeah. the hell's going on here? So you also, in those emails, saw the name Wild Bill. Uh, that's right, yeah. I, I'm sorry. In, in, in some of the emails, there were references to Wild Bill. And no full name, but there was this Wild Bill. So we were obviously curious who the heck Wild Bill was. Did you initially think that Wild Bill was Ghost Rider? You know, it looked like it, yeah. It looked like from the emails that the two were tied together, it was Wild Bill. But, you know, we had no inclination who Wild Bill was. Somebody asked me in one of the presentations whether we thought it was the owner, Billy Hayes. And honestly, it, it, it didn't occur to me until somebody asked that question, but uh, we didn't have that suspicion. But as, you know, as we did the background into exile, you know, we pulled the corporate records, we pulled the uh, bankruptcy uh, information, and it became clear that the guy that owned exile was William Panetta. Uh, so, you know, right Wild away, yeah. you know, we figured, hey, that's got to be Wild Bill. <clears throat> 
So, you know, at that point, we, we, you know, we, we knew we were on to something. The other thing that came up when we, when we investigated both uh, Exile and Panetta is that Panetta had a history of financial problems. Uh, obviously, his company had gone bankrupt three years ago. He had some outstanding judgments and liens from, from a few years ago. Uh, but then all of a sudden, and more recently, he had made a very uh, high-end automobile purchase. He bought a, uh, a Mercedes Roadster. Yeah. So this guy's financial condition had changed drastically over the, over the last three years from being, uh, you know, really poor, his company going bankrupt, to, uh, to you know, buying a, a, a new automobile for, for cash, it looked like, for over $100,000. So, you know, we knew something fishy was going on here. Uh, we yeah. suspected, you know, we knew he was behind exile. At that point, we had the two connected. We knew that there was this connection to Wild Bill. Um, we looked further than at the invoices for exile because, obviously, they were a suspect party. So we, we, we went back several years and looked at all the invoices that were paid at exile, and it turned out that, that uh, only one person had approved those invoices, and that was Jane Brown. So she was, she was an engineer, and she would have been responsible for, you know, keeping the, uh, the production line going, uh, you know, implementing new parts into the production line, doing repairs and maintenance. Um, so it wasn't totally, you know, out of the ordinary that she would have been ordering parts from Exile, but the fact that she approved all the purchases sort of stood out. When you looked at other vendors in that same area, a number of other people approved the purchases. And she also, she approved them, you know, in a non-standard way, right? That's right. You know, that didn't come out uh, until a little bit later on, but from the data, we could see that, okay, she was the one approving all the invoices from Exile. And, you know, we did some analysis on the payments uh, to Exile over the, over the last five years, and it was about $6 million. So at that point, we said, you know, we, we knew there was a problem here, but we wanted to talk to people, do some interviews of other people in the in the company yeah. to determine, you know, how, how did this happen? How could she circumvent the normal process? And so we started with the receiving department, and we interviewed uh, the head of the receiving department, a guy, Brian Jones was his name. He let us know that, well, they, they had all these problems with the production line, so it wasn't uncommon from Brown to get the parts directly as opposed to them going through the normal receiving process where they would be um, cataloged and, and entered into the system by the receiving department, they would be received directly by Brown, and then she would just let them know that she'd received the parts. And she did that by, uh, by providing them with uh, FedEx documentation that the, the, uh, the shipments had come in. And her excuse was, hey, I can't wait for you guys to receive these parts and log everything in and then, you know, uh, get get the parts to me the next day. I, I've got to get these parts and keep this production line going. So in hindsight, was that a red flag? It's a big red flag. I mean, it's, you know, that's why procedures like receiving and, you know, other internal controls exist, uh, is so you can, you can catch problems like this or you can prevent them from happening. The fact that they circumvented this control, you know, really allowed this fraud to, uh, to take place and, and continue over a, a number of years. So that was, that was a big problem. And, you know, when we found out that she had been going around the process, then it became clear how she, how she was able to do this. We also, we got the FedEx documentations from the receiving uh, people, and we compared those to, uh, we were able to access uh, FedEx documentation as well, and we compared the two, and it was clear that the, the, the FedEx documentation that, that Brown had provided was, uh, was fictitious. It didn't exist. So, you know, pretty clear what was happening here. So you decided to go after Wild Bill, the president of Exile, first in the interviewing process. Why did you see him as the weakest link in the fraud? We thought he might be the weakest link. He was outside of the company, first of all, and we were able to convince him that, that the owner really didn't care about him. He was outside of the company, but the owner wanted, you know, wanted to go after the people inside the company who were responsible for this, the employees that he trusted. So, you know, we, we used that argument with Panetta. You know, we, we laid out some of the evidence that we had, um, you know, and he didn't fight too hard. He knew, he, he knew that we had him, and he, he went ahead and explained the, uh, the scheme to us. So, he, you know, he was the weakest link of the three. And, he, you know, he gave us a lot of details about how, how, the, how the fraud occurred. You know, it originally started out as a kickback scheme before Exile went bankrupt. You know, Jane Brown had actually come to him and, and said, you know, listen, we'll increase your sales if you if you kick us back uh, 20%. And he could even raise his prices by 20%. So he did that for a few years, was able to make some money that way. Uh, but, you know, his 
He, you know, he was sort of a sad sack guy. He, you know, his wife had left him. He had gone through a divorce. He had a lot of financial problems. Uh, aside from this account, you know, Exile was not doing well, so he had a lot of financial problems. And once he went bankrupt, you know, Brown came to him and said, listen, you know, I know you're bankrupt, but here, here's one way we can help you out. Instead of kickbacks on legitimate shipments of parts, you know, we'll just make this an outright fictitious vendor scheme. Faced with the overwhelming evidence collected by Jay and Angela, Wild Bill quickly unraveled and gave up the details of the fraud. He was given a lesser sentence for his inside information, but ultimately ended up behind bars with Jane and Luke. Because of Jay's surveillance and investigation know-how and Angela's data analytics skills, law enforcement and attorneys had everything they needed to convict. As Jay mentions in the bribery and corruption casebook, the case was handed over to police wrapped up in a bow. However, what makes this case significant was what happened after the trial. Brewcorp President Billy Hayes was like any other wronged victim. He not only wanted justice, he wanted his money back. Using bank records, Jay and Angela tracked some of the money to banks in the U.S., but several statements stood out from the rest. Payments to a marina in the Hamptons. The harbor master at the marina recognized Jane's and Luke's photographs and even remembered the 50-foot yacht they moored there before moving it to the Caribbean. Surveillance revealed that the couple had traveled to the island of Tortola several times, and lo and behold, Jay and Angela found not only the boat, but more than $900,000 in a fake corporation's bank account. While this case had a relatively happy ending, with Hayes getting back almost $3 million of the stolen $4.4 million, not all victims fare as well. But as Jay pointed out, the red flags were there, and the case provides several lessons learned. Number one. Conduct background checks on employees and third-party vendors. Checks on Jane and Luke may not have revealed anything, as these were their first offenses, but a check on Exile Industries would have shown a bankrupt company receiving invoices and a destitute owner buying a new Mercedes. Number two, prevention works. Because of Jay's surveillance measures put in place before the fraud, he was able to get a lead on Luke when he saw him come into work on Sunday at 1 a.m. to send out a few emails. And finally, number three, circumventing processes and procedures isn't always just laziness or ineptitude. It could be something bigger. Digging deeper into why Jane went around normal operating procedures with the FedEx purchasing invoices might have saved Brewcore some money and stopped the fraud sooner. Thank you for listening to Fraud Talk, and we hope you join us next month. For more information about the bribery and corruption casebook mentioned in this podcast, visit acfe.com.